So it's it, on broad populations, absolutely can do that. But on an individual patient, it falls apart. Yes. Why do you see the future of having the patient peers on? I mean, there are always going to be kids who aren't diagnosed until birth, or who just aren't candidates for any type of fetal intervention. Gore-Tex has been around for quite a while. It doesn't work for a lot of the kids. And the dominant muscle flat. But are we, where's the research on that one? Well, <laughs> It, it, it will become very interesting as this plays out. Um, you can you can engineer diaphragm. Uh, it's been done in animals by by engineering. Um, it's been done in animals. You can now it's got to be prenatally diagnosed. I imagine you can do it after roots as well, but it takes a period of time to grow the thing. But you can harvest uh, cells from the amniotic fluid, which are fetal cells. We can then we can then seed a a um, scaffold of material with those cells and, and let them grow till they cover the whole scaffold. You take that scaffold, put it in a defect you create in a lamp. Now it has to have blood supply so the fat lining around the stomach is momentum that you can sew up to it to bring blood supply. And that will create a, a tissue construct now. Okay, so it's the lamb cells on this construct and that will grow. <coughs> Uh, and uh, with the patient. So you can do that. But, um, the folks in, in Children's in Boston are four years into trying to get their phase one study up to ground. There's all sorts of stuff uh, in terms of IRB approval and everything else. And we, uh, <coughs> I don't know, we could get, we could get up to speed in about a year and a half in Houston right now with what we're doing. But, um, but the, the cost is going to be huge. It's not, true. it's not a trivial thing to put all that together to grow it, to put it in and everything else like that. Uh, so conceptually, it's a, it's a great idea because then it's the patient's own tissue and it grows with them and that, that fixes the problem, so to speak. Um, I don't know if we're going to end up with that or not. And, uh, and the, the uh, broader answer, and unfortunately today, for me at least, is uh, when I have an extremely large defect uh, patient, I view that as a staged operation. Stage one is to, is to close the defect, have the baby live, get off that, and then deal with the recurrence today on, on a decision basis. Just one last question. The, the progressive hypercapnia. In 2004, when our daughter was born, I could still remember our surgeon and our neonatologist, I mean, like this about ventilator settings and, and different things. I mean, is there still that? And this was at Texas Children's, so I mean, this wasn't at. That's a known place for this. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, just, you know. That's just a little. <laughs> but, uh, real, I, I'll just put it this way real vigorous debate. Yes, I understand. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, if you, the, the registry is by definition comprised of centers that have more than just a I mean, in the sense that you got to, someone's got to physically put the data in the registry form, so you have to have more than a passing interest in it. Uh, if you look at the registry, however, permissive hypercap or, or hyperventilation has almost completely disappeared. Uh, that doesn't represent care across the country. That represents care in centers with an interest in that and currently because they're participating in the registry. So there, <coughs> there remain some people with differences of opinion. It took until um, I first started doing ECMO in 1986. <clears throat> I started the, the first ECMO program in Houston in 91 when I got here to Houston. And even in, even then, it, there was definitely this about ECMO. <laughs> and, uh, and it wasn't until the, the, the UK trial that got published in 96 that, that you started to see some of this completely just like disappearing. But there were strong, passionate opinions about stuff for a long time. And I, some of that is just disseminating information. <clears throat> you know, I've given grand rounds at a few places that the surgeons have asked me to come just, just with the intent to kind of say, here's, here's where the world is, you know. And then they, everyone go, well, look, this is where the world is. We need to move in that direction. Uh, it is useful once people start looking at their data so you know how you do them. 
uh, because it's not, it's not, there's no requirement that, that you track every single neonatal outcome. You do carry track tests, but get them on every hospital to do that. But they don't have to track their outcomes for neonatal surgery. The only really registry requirement is congenital heart surgery. There's a registry for congenital heart surgery that the state of Texas requires. It's not required on a national basis, by the way. Uh, but for diaphragmatic hernia or, or the other problems that I'm dealing with, that I deal with as a surgeon, congenital problems, there's no requirement that, any, that anybody keeps track of this data on, on individual disease-specific problems. But in the places that have, it, it's very useful for us because when we start looking, once we started risk stratifying, if I looked at my raw numbers about eight years ago, life's good, we're doing fine. But once we started risk stratifying, I was actually doing really well in the moderate to good diaphragm, but not as good in the very, very high risk. That enabled me to sit down with the neonatologist and go, we've got to talk about strategies and, and management, and we've sort of sub subsequently uh, <coughs> come up to speak, yeah, but we're a lot better than that. Uh, so looking at the data and then risk stratifying can help people. We've got to have, have to start doing that. Just, it's just a comment. The frustrating thing is when you're trying to advise people nowadays, you know, of which hospitals to go to. I mean, there, there still are, in my opinion, I guess what I've seen, a number of hospitals who, who are 10 years or 15 years behind on that ventilation strategy. And it's, it's frustrating when someone you're trying to help still decides to go there because, you know, it's close to their house or, or whatever. And, it's, it's just a common frustration we've experienced a couple yeah, of times. Yeah, all you can do is give information. You can't put a gun to people. So yeah, yeah. yeah um, I'm from Australia, so a lot of this is kind of... Well, we got we've got several in the registry. registry. <laughs> yeah, I saw and, that there was two. They're also my best. Well, <laughs> my, my question is about ECMO, because we don't use it in Australia at all. So we're not a, a case where we're a hospital that has small birth defects only. We have the full range. Are you able to compare the... And I'm sure there's other countries, like kind of in places in Canada, they don't use it. Is that true? Yeah, there's a very low use of ECMO in uh, Toronto. So, are you able to compare the centres and work out, you know, where the ECMO is? Um, like you said, there's controversy still. So there's whether a couple it's... of other things that 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 we get. We haven't done them done yet. Is a short answer. Uh, people report their survivals with and without ECMO is very similar. <clears throat> if you just look at the run. What's unknown is a couple of things. One, people don't report their non-operative rate. That's a big number that varies a lot. Uh, part of it is personal decision. Part of it is, you know, gestalt. I mean, my own personal philosophy is I try and, and repair almost everybody we can. But in some other places that might not be the case, <clears throat> no repair, death. The incident, the range of no repair is 6 to 25%. <clears throat> It's a huge if That doesn't get reported anywhere. Now, one of the things in, in the proposed staging system will be, that's one of the criteria. You have to put the no repairs in so you know what's going on. The, now, the other reason to do no repair, if you have an infant with severe chromosomal anomaly, trisomy 13, they got a horrible heart pump down. Uh, so, by the way, by that definition, we, we our target is not 100% survival. There's no way we can ever do that. There's too many. Some of these kids have too many. So it's not 100% not where we're, where we're going to hit anyway. The second issue is, is that in reporting those out.